Um, be before we start, just a special thank you to our sponsors. Be sure to check out each sponsor's virtual booth in the virtual expo. Um, Sam, the floor is now yours to get started. All right, what's up, everybody? Hold on one second. I think I've got to start. Uh, okay, pause, stop. I am recording. Okay. Um, how's everybody doing? What's happening? Uh, welcome. I think uh, technically I'm starting a minute from now. So I'm going to give this uh, a second to get going. But um, hello, everybody. Welcome. It's always weird when I can't see anybody's faces. We used to do these in person and uh, that is no longer the case. Uh, Brad, what's up, man? Married life is good. Appreciate the question. I actually, I am a very happily married man now. Um, and uh, yeah, that has been awesome so far. It's good to see all of you. Who all do I know? Uh, here. Actually, I'm gonna stop wasting time. We are gonna be punctual and uh, we, are, we are gonna get this kicked off. So uh, first, and foremost, I am going to go ahead and share my screen. And actually, let me just go and this keynote set real quick. Get back to the first slide. And uh, here we go. We are going to kick this off. So, everybody, welcome to uh, Blueprint for a Micro Budget Feature Film. And uh, we are going to cover a lot today. I've got about 50 minutes. I don't know exactly how much of this we'll get through, but I'm hoping we get through a whole bunch of it. Uh, the agenda does not look that long, uh, but there's a lot to sort of go through. And what I'm going to try and do is, is try and paint with real world examples, a lot of the things that I've seen and uh, how you all can avoid these. And just so you know, this is not just work for a feature film, but it is the best example of this. This works just as well for episodic or for uh, uh, even a short film. Uh, it's just literally a feature film is typically the hardest thing or is known to be the hardest thing. However, pilots are doing a long show. It would be the fundamentally the same workflow just with uh, you know, a large, if this was a Netflix series, it would be the same thing just for however long this is to turn out each episode. But the bottom line is we're going to give you an approach uh, and these core concepts will work for any budget, big or small, but are particularly suited to productions where you do not have the luxury uh, to light money on fire, which is what typically the studio system has. And that's the difference between independent filmmakers and non-independent filmmakers is that there is very little margin for error. So, you know, a question some of you might have is why am I qualified to talk about this? Why would I know anything about this? Uh, so I am uh, the CEO of a company called We Make Movies. And uh, I'm going to pause the screen share and we're going to go over and just take a look at that website real quick and you can get a sense of, of who we are and what we do. And uh, fundamentally, first and foremost, we are a filmmaking community that we started 10 years ago in Los Angeles, but we have now gone virtual where we are all over the US and really around the world now, if you wanna come in and check out the meeting. And uh, I'm actually looking for my web browser. This is weird. Um, where is Safari here? Uh, oh, there we go. Okay, so there is, uh, this is wemakemovies.org. And we do a bunch of things. We solve problems for independent filmmakers. Uh, but first and foremost, you're here to talk about features. And uh, we view ourselves as a little bit of a community. We solve problems for independent filmmakers. We're a branded content agency. But we also launched this competition uh, where we are now, we have actually greenlit and we're about to announce the results of the competition in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but we, it's really a cross between Project Greenlight and uh, basically uh, Project Greenlight and Shark Tank. And we are greenlighting three feature films uh, that are all micro budget feature films with $25,000 budgets. We've had hundreds of people submit. We're now down to the final three that we'll be announcing soon. And they're going to go make movies according to the methodology that I'm gonna lay out for you here today. And not that you need to do it this way, but ideally, hopefully everything that I walk through is going to give you a couple of 
of ideas. And we're also going to be launching an incubator where other people outside of the winners are going to be able to participate in a lot of the things that we're doing. So stay tuned for that. If you're interested in what we're doing, just go to wemakemovies.org and sign up for a free account and come get involved. We've got meetings every Wednesday. There's hosts of things we do. You'll be on the newsletter. All kinds of great things will happen. But I just wanted to share that because we actually are making movies this way. So everything that I'm here to talk to you about has either been based on something I've seen go wrong on other productions or uh, something that we have come up with in the workflow lab to sort of solve these problems for independent filmmakers. So that's enough of a preamble. Now let's get back to the keynote and uh, we'll go ahead and dive in and start going through uh, the various things. So uh, what are we gonna cover today? We're gonna cover the road to hell for filmmakers. We're gonna cover the core technologies you need to understand uh, in your workflow, core concepts that save you money, time, and aggravation. And uh, let me go full screen here. And uh, we are going to cover a no compromise cinema package that you can get uh, on your own that will allow you to make uh, a cinema quality movie, uh, as well as a better image pipeline for onset and post-production and some gear recommendations that'll be, that'll be posting along the way. So uh, where are we gonna start? We are going to start uh, with a little bit of story time and uh, something you should just understand is that the road to hell in a lot of cases for filmmakers is paved with good intentions. And everything I'm about to share with you, I'm gonna go on a long story and just kind of tell you just through direct example some of the things that can go wrong, you know, if you haven't made a feature film, you uh, hopefully none of this ever happens to you. And if you have made a feature film, I truly hope you're able to avoid it based on some of the stuff that we're covering. A lot of this is like a public service for me to be able to share some of this. But uh, the situation is a first time director miraculously raises a large amount of money to make their dream movie. Everyone is overjoyed at the beginning to... Uh, uh, to only to you only live once it and cross this off the bucket list, uh, but they're going to do it smart and they're going to do it the right way. And they've gotten all kinds of advice on how to do things from all the different people in their world. And basically what happens is they start assembling crew members. And what I'm going to talk you through now is some of the things uh, that will happen. Uh, so this director will, will go and hire a DP who wants to shoot 4K anamorphic on the Alexa because letterboxing is awesome. And the Alexa is the only camera real DP use, real DPs use. And they've heard that Airy Raw is the highest quality. Uh, and they also want to have a different LUT for every scene. And they want to bake them into the dailies so color correction doesn't get messed up later if the DP isn't brought in to be a part of it, which is something that frequently happens and, and DPs want to avoid. So they hire this DP and they follow those suggestions, uh, at which point uh, they hire a sound person uh, and the sound person frequently on, when they do their documentary work records uh, the sound at a time base of 30 frames per second, uh, not drop frame. And because that's how they normally do it when they record the reality shows, they also don't record any time code because no one asked them to rent a locket box for the set. Uh, they don't really bother uh, recording IXML because no one they work with ever asked them for it. Uh, but they will have a smart slate though, which is, which is great. Uh, and then uh, they will often hire a DIT to be on set, uh, who is typically a cheerful intern who barely knows how to use a Mac and has no post-production experience who is then hired to copy all of the media onto a single $100 uh, four terabyte drive that's, that one of the producers bought. And the shoot will typically happen and this intern will file will transfer files uh, to a drive to be handed off to an editor. We'll start editing once the movie is done. And usually that editor has may or may not have been hired before the movie starts. Uh, from there, this editor uh, will often be a high-end commercial editor who knows Premiere because that's what all the pros use and wants to get into narrative work. Uh, so they have a great story sense though, and they really want to cut their teeth on a feature film. Uh, they don't really like to do assistant editing work though. 
Uh, so they would definitely prefer if someone else was going to do all of that stuff for them. Usually the director will then agree to find someone to do all the prep and do all the syncing and all the stuff that that editor doesn't want to do. Uh, that editor just wants to work on the story. So, but they will be starting after the movie starts uh, with the hundred dollar hard drive that someone's going to hand them. And from there, uh, they will start to probably look around to who's going to finish the movie for them. They'll start to talk to various sound designers at high-end sound design because they want the movie to really sound professional. It's very important uh, that a good sound mix, you know, they've heard that a good sound mix can make or break a movie and they certainly don't want to cheap out on sound at the very end. So they'll usually spend anywhere from fifteen dollars to $25,000 on a sound mix. Uh, the deliverables, uh, it, oh, and uh, let's not forget color correction. Uh, the movie needs to look awesome, as we all know, and uh, everyone knows that the difference uh, color correction can make. So the director can uh, it typically finds a deal with the post house who is going to work with them when the movie's over. Uh, they're going to get a way lower rate than they would typically charge a studio, for instance, and they're going to work, you know, probably with an assistant colorist. And all they need to do is bring in the movie at the end and the post house is going to handle it and everything is going to be fine. So uh what can go wrong with this plan uh nothing ever goes wrong uh, in filmmaking so uh they go off they shoot for for a 15 day 30 location shoot uh which they assumed would be plenty of time to cover everything uh the shoot happens and according to the producers and director it went amazingly well but there were a few small issues uh so for instance they shot 12 terabytes of media uh of 4k anamorphic airy raw media uh, and so it turned out they needed to buy three more of those hundred dollar four terabyte drives. Uh, they weren't actually able to play back any of the media though, which was weird. And the copy times took forever. Uh, but they mostly thought it was because the DIT didn't know what they were doing. So the big lesson that they decided they were going to learn was they were going to hire someone more experienced next time around, uh, so that the copy times and they'd be able to monitor the footage and do all of that. So that would, that would work out nicely. Uh, they also... Couldn't watch the footage for some reason, um, but they know that when they hand it off to their editor, that's going to work out. And um, basically, the DP was really happy with what they were shooting on set, though, so they're pretty confident that everything is going to cut together. Uh, and they had to, but they had to chop a lot of their coverage because there were so many company moves, but they think they got most of it. And uh, the bottom line is everyone who was the core participant thought they got what they needed to make the movie the way they needed to make it. Uh, so to recap, four hard drives were used with 12 terabytes of footage and all of the individual LUTs for the various scenes and the sound uh, and all of the handwritten camera sound reports and script supervisors are then turned over to the editor, who's a commercial editor that they hired uh, after the shoot was over. And so this editor uh, tries bringing in the airy raw footage into Premiere and it doesn't seem to open for some reason, which is weird. And it turns out that it doesn't work natively in there. So they've got to make the dailies now for everything. Uh, and he tells production to hire an assistant editor to make the dailies from the airy raw that he can use in the edit. And they should sync the sound too while they're at it because none of the sound has been synced to the picture. So what happens there? Uh, in the dailies process, the assistant editor is then hired at uh, $200 a day to work in Resolve to create dailies uh, from the airy raw footage that works natively in Resolve. That assistant has a hard time figuring out what goes with what as the media management and folder structure that the DIT had on set wasn't ideal. But after three weeks of solid work, uh, a letterbox 1080p airy raw dailies are turned over to the editor's to the editor to work with, and all of the LUTs have been correctly placed onto the footage. Also, uh, some of the footage, and, and keep in mind that these Airy Raw dailies were in 1080p. Uh, they shot in 4K though. And also, uh, some of the audio was recorded at the wrong time base. So some of the dailies actually drift a little bit out of sync as you watch them, uh, but they should be able to fix that in the edit. You know, so they hand that over to the editor and uh, it turns out they had to buy another $100 drive to put all the dailies on there as well. Uh, and that is also running slowly for some reason, but it was cheap. Uh, so from there, the editor finally begins editing the movie. Uh, it turns out they didn't quite get all of the coverage they needed, but everything, according to everybody, the movie turned out pretty well. And they were able to cut some scenes and still get a rough cut. And they were really happy. 
uh it took till november to get there uh unfortunately though but and they do have a sundance deadline that they had to hit um so uh it also turned out that the handwritten script binder that the script supervisor was using was never opened and the camera sound reports that everyone spent a lot of time filling out were never actually used they also eventually had to buy a faster raid drive because they were having all kinds of beach balls while editing and that cost a few thousand dollars and also uh, a lot of the time was lost resyncing the audio to the dailies that were the 1080p uh, anamorphic dailies that were made. They also now need to get the movie finished in time for January with the Sundance deadline, the final Sundance deadline looming. And uh, he doesn't have any, the editor has no online editing experience. So he brings the raid with the movie over to a post house. The post house can't unfortunately figure out how to reconnect the original sound and video me media to the 1080 dead dailies that were made by the assistant editor way back when. So they decide to finish the whole movie in 1080p and upscale it to 4K uh, and make a DCP from that for the Sundance deadline. Uh, temp VFX is done on the 1080p daily shots and the sound mix is done based on the Sundance deadline. They unfortunately, it turns out, don't get into Sundance. But the good news is they get to recut the movie now and uh, and the only problem is now they need to redo all of the expensive sound and color work they did getting ready for the Sundance deadline. Uh, and uh, they have to now have an additional Kickstarter campaign for this. And uh, this time it's going to go through a final laborious, they, they're gonna learn from the mistake though and go through a laborious process to rebuild the movie with the original media that they shot, which was an Airy Raw. And, work on that from their resolve and that costs them an additional ten thousand dollars then they have to redo their sound mix because they've made a lot of picture edits and that has to be completely redone uh and that's going to cost them an additional fifteen thousand dollars then they get into a high couple high profile festivals based on the recut and being able to spend the time editing the movie and uh they're able to sell that movie to a distributor which is very exciting uh, who the distributor then asked them to recut the movie again uh, based on some ideas they had and th to think make it more sellable to Netflix. Uh, so this cost them an additional $15,000 in, in additional changes. And, uh, and then, um, but the good news is Netflix is going to pay them $25,000 to receive the movie. So, and I promise I'm almost, almost done and I'm going to start getting to, to some of these things. Uh, so uh, the good news is they got the $25,000 from Netflix, but the only problem is that the filmmakers then have to spend an additional $50,000 creating all of the different deliverables uh, in different languages that Netflix asked for and making all the different video files and going through all this. And they have to go through a post house and the post house costs, charges them $50,000 for this service. Uh, so uh, basically they also had to lost an additional $20,000 in additional sound, color, and VFX fixes to hit the final distribution deliverable they had to hit. So in all, in the net result, in addition to the entire budget for the movie, shooting everything, uh, their movie brought in $25,000 to get it onto Netflix, and it cost them over $100,000 just in the various production fixes, deliverables, and extra costs that would have been easily avoided if they had a proper post-production workflow and process for their movie. So as I said, uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, but the good news is you are here now and we're gonna be able to walk through uh, a lot of the different things that they could have avoided along the way and then prescriptive things that they could do in the future if they ever did this again, or if you're gonna go make a movie yourself, how you could avoid this and settle into a workflow that's gonna really work for you. So the first thing is uh, oftentimes directors like to label themselves as creative types who aren't that technical and they trust the team that they're gonna hire to figure out the workflow for them. And oftentimes they will have impractical expectations for the release uh, of the movie with no real understanding of the deliverables. What should happen is probably they need to have an understanding of the technical side so they can have conversations with each of their collaborators that are going to allow them to really figure out the process they want to follow to create the movie that they want to make. And so oftentimes this will begin with the DP uh, or cinematographer who wants to shoot uh, a lot of times DPs will often want to shoot anamorphic uh, with a 
uh, 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio that will fill the screen. Now, unfortunately, most people's televisions, if you're going to deliver this to Netflix, uh, are 16 by 9. And so you're going to lock yourself in with an anamorphic ratio with no distribution deal in place uh, that may actually limit your distribution options and the amount of money that you can bring in. You really want to think through when you decide uh, resolution and aspect ratio, uh, where are you designing this movie for? If it's designed for a streaming service like Netflix or one of the others, you might want to consider uh, 185 to 1 or 16 by 9 over something like anamorphic. Uh, additionally, um, cinematographers will often want to use a different LUT for every scene and they'll either want them baked into the dailies. I don't recommend making dailies at all. We'll cover that in a little while. Or uh, they'll want different LUTs that are going to go and they will, uh, and LUTs, by the way, just to understand, these are really only basic primary color corrections. And so a LUT can easily be undone. Or if somebody knows how to, you know, do color correction uh, in the edit are very easy to recreate in post-production. So realistically, having lots of different LUTs that you use over the course of a scene is not necessarily recommended, but oftentimes the DP will also insist on editing with the LUTs baked into the dailies uh, instead of working with the original media. This can be problematic, but there's also ways to apply LUTs in the edit. But ideally, you're only going to use one so that you don't have to have a lot of... Um, doing and redoing and the editor doesn't have to track a lot of stuff in prep, especially for a low budget uh, feature film, you don't have a lot of time to waste. So additional things that will happen with the sound person is the sound person will oftentimes record uh, at the wrong time base versus the frame rate. I've actually seen this happen more times than you can imagine. You wouldn't believe this, but this happens relentlessly. Um, but the oftentimes they record at the wrong time base versus the movie frame rate, which is typically 2398. Sometimes they'll shoot, they'll record at 24 frames per second, which will then, so 24 and 2398 are slightly different, but over time you will see the audio that's synced by 24 frames per second recordings drift over a 23.98 file, or if they record at 30 versus 24 or 2398, or uh, if Basically, 2997 and 2398 should be compatible because they have the, the uh, drop frame. Uh, but if you shoot at 24 or 30, you will typically run into an issue. Uh, additionally, they sometimes don't jam sync time code, which is going to cost you a lot of time in syncing later. And they often don't use IXML, which we'll cover in a little bit. Uh, additionally, problems with DITs is oftentimes, especially for independent films, they are they have very little experience with post-production and often don't know how the editor will be working. Uh, they typically don't have uh, file and media management skills that are designed for the editors that they're gonna be working with later. And they're certainly not thinking about how the editor wants to be working. They're just trying to get through the day and get everything uh, offloaded. Uh, typically productions will have uh, very slow hard drives with two small capacities requiring in many additional drive purchases and constant spinning beach balls. And uh, usually this poor DIT leaving set very late uh, in the night because they are the only person, they have to make sure that the footage transfers. And then oftentimes uh, you should uh, have multiple drives that you're copying to on set. And ideally you're copying to three individual sources of media every time. And ideally two of those sources do not live on set, you know, so you're, so you're going to have shuttle drives that are going to and from, but in many cases, people will only shoot one, uh, will only copy one copy of the media. And if anything happens to the cheap drive they typically buy, you're jeopardizing the work of everyone that's on set. So uh, basically, make multiple copies. Uh, additionally, there's problems with the script supervisors. This is a personal pet peeve of mine, but I cannot tell you how many times I've been handed this elaborate handwritten binder with notes, handwritten camera reports, handwritten sound reports that literally has no metadata that I can use in my edit. This is totally useless in modern technology. Everything else uh, with it, it seems like in the world is now digital, except for whatever reason that typically the script supervisor notes and process is often not handling, handing useful digital uh, resources over to an editor that will make their life easier. They, they typically have to go through the book and then there's a laborious syncing and assistant edit process that, that ends up coming. I'm gonna show you how to avoid that shortly as well. So 
uh, the problems with the editor that you will typically face is uh, they typically have no technical or assistant editor skills. Sometimes if they're a high-end uh, feature editor, uh, especially someone used to Avid and they, they cut lots of television, they often have their assistants do everything for them. And in an independent film world, uh, you want an editor who actually knows how to do their own prep and is very, very efficient with this because typically you're paying them under their daily rate. So what's going to happen is you're going to want someone who can eat their own dog food and uh, can prep something very quickly so that you get more of their creative time ending up on the movie on screen. Uh, additionally, um, sometimes editors do not have very good media management skills. So if they're going to pass to another editor later or, or work with the director or something else, their media may be all over the place. And, and the biggest thing is typically they have no idea how to properly turn over to a uh, colorist or to a sound person. And this can be very, very costly, uh, as you heard in my story. So uh, the problems with the colorist that you may have is uh, typically this is done through a low bidding post house that really wants to book the job and is not going to be particularly honest with you about how much that job is going to cost. You're only going to find out later once you're, you're deep in it. Uh, and this can be a very, very costly Thing. They also, the lower your bid is from that post house, typically the lower grade of a colorist they're going to assign to your movie. Uh, they'll often tell you that an edit, uh, that an editing platform like Final Cut Pro is not professional enough and that they should have edited an Avid. Usually this is there to cover the fact that they don't typically know how to work with a Final Cut Pro XML. Uh, oftentimes uh, they'll mess up your conform so your movie will not look like the one that your editor turned over to them. Uh, they oftentimes can't link back to your original media because they don't necessarily know how that's located. Sometimes it's not always their fault. Sometimes it's the editor's fault or the dailies were done improperly. There's lots of reasons it can happen. Uh, but uh, they insist on using something besides Resolve to finish your movie. Oftentimes, uh, this will be something like a base light or a Pablo. These uh, in modern times are far more expensive things that don't really do anything that Resolve doesn't do. It certainly isn't needed for anything that is not in... Um, the final cut worlds don't even consider any, using anything really besides resolve unless you're going to unless you're not really being charged by the hour on it. Um, and uh, they also typically want you to transcode to something like DPX. I cannot tell you how many movies uh, I've heard about that have wanted to transcode red raw to DPX, which defeats the whole process of shooting raw in the first place. But mostly that's just how they do it. So that's the way that they do it. Um, and the biggest thing to avoid is uh, they'll often try and sell you a lot of things and a lot of processes, uh, color grading to multiple color spaces, et cetera, that you don't necessarily understand and you don't know why you need them. And oftentimes there's a reason for it, but if you don't know what it is, don't go ahead with it. Uh, additionally, uh, there's problems with the sound designer. Uh, oftentimes uh, you don't lock picture before you start your sound mix and this because of the way that uh, especially Pro Tools uh, works, um, if your movie's not locked uh, and you're, you're working with reels in a film, for instance, uh, it is a enormous process to create typically either a new OMF or AAF and sync that to the work they've done previously. Uh, you wouldn't, in video, it's not as hard, but in sound, it is excruciating to make picture changes. And the more elaborate your sound mix, the more costly and time consuming these become. So typically they're very insistent on you not turning over until you're absolutely finished. But the problem happens if you're delivering for a film festival or something happens, you often get in this situation where you can't avoid it. Uh, and also you lose, if you don't have an organized OMF or AAF, this can become a very, very time-consuming process and you lose a lot of the creative time the sound designer might put into your project into them literally just laying out your media so that they can begin work with it. It's awful. Uh, you also can spend way too much money on a festival mix that you have to remix prior to distribution. So that story that I told you is very, very real. Going back to your sound designer multiple times and paying them multiple times to do the same work on a movie because the movie was not finished. And so there's too many other things that can go wrong to count, but, but you have to be very, very careful because the sound designer at the very end, especially if you use many of the high-end sound designers are, are very, very costly part of your post-production budget. So 
this will, as I stated earlier, uh, lead you to some of the problems that you're going to run into deliverables, which is I can't tell you how many people lose endless amounts of money and rush their movies because they need to hit the Sundance deadline that they almost have 0% chance of getting into. Uh, they also uh, pay to finish sound and color for that submission, and then they don't get into Sundance, but they and they might need to make a DCP. So they then decide to recut this whole movie. Everything I just described happens. They cost it. This, this can be tens of tens of thousands of dollars uh, leading into a modern thing. I, I recently just had a friend who sold her film and she paid uh, $50,000 uh, to create the deliverables that were required for Netflix in order to get her movie up there. Uh, she and, and this was just a bill she had to pay as a means of getting it up there. This was a tax that she had to pay. That's a real number charged by a real post house and there was nothing she could do about it. I'm not making this up. So you just need to understand what you're getting into and no one tells you usually until it's too late. And because you have, because it's your dream and you have to pay for the movie, you are stuck getting to the finish line. So this for a filmmaker, is the road to hell, in my opinion. Uh, and it's it's paved with the good intention of making a dream project. Uh, I empathize, I've seen this car accident happen in slow motion uh, for more than a decade now. Uh, and it's painful to watch and you, you keep watching it happen, but uh, there is a better way. So let's spend the rest of this time, that was a long preamble, going through what that way is. So a few core technologies you need to understand and I'm going to kind of speed through this because I want to make sure we can go through this. But XML fundamentally is an interchange format that allows you to kind of move between different applications, whether this is shot notes to Final Cut, Final Cut to Resolve, Final Cut to Logic. This all operates over a file in an interchange format called XML. And it carries data about your clip so that when you pass an XML from Final Cut to uh, another application, your clips are gonna show up with the same info in the same order. Basically though, it's not a perfect science and the less you have, and there's a lot of gotchas with it. So the less you have to leave your application and the less you have to use it, the less things that are gonna go wrong because it's just not a perfect science. So uh, what is IXML? Uh, IXML is not XML. Uh, it's actually for sound people, but what it really allows you to do is, and this can happen with your, your sound recorders right at the very beginning is, they can literally enter this in on many uh, sound, I, why can't I think of the word, uh, recorders like the Zoom, uh, the Zoom F8, for instance, is one, but just make sure that your wh whoever's recording your sound can record IXML, label the components, the individual components and microphones that are going to make up the multi-channel wave file that they're going to deliver to the editor. Make sure they can do this and, and so that when your channel, when your multi-channel wave file appears, for instance, in Final Cut, it's going to have all of your audio labeled on it. And those, uh, so for every channel you have, it might say Boom, it might say Rick, it might say uh, Stephanie, you know, whatever the character's name is, and they can label these and that's going to appear on your audio files. And those audio files will even become roles that will then appear in your sound designers uh, tracks later making for a really easy conform. This is a very key technology that's gonna save you a ton of time, money, and effort. Uh, additionally, uh, Shot Notes X is an application uh, that uh, I actually helped design with uh, Kevin Bailey way back when, but what it allows you to do is really simplify the process for taking every, basically you have, instead of filling out a binder, a script supervisor will uh, work with a Google document, fill out a spreadsheet and a template generated by Shot Notes X, and uh, they will label scene, take, uh, keywords, camera angle, notes, all of these things will be taken from the spreadsheet and then via XML will be applied to your clips within a minute of downloading them onto a drive. So this can be happened on set, which is going to lead to your clips being properly named. You'll be able to find everything. You can apply keyword, all the keywords will be applied. This is a beautifully designed. It's as if you had an assistant editor, but that assistant editor can live on set with you and can be prepping these things as you go through it. I cannot tell you how much time and aggravation this saves you. Uh, and ideally, you have someone on set doing this, and, and you can even begin your edit this way. An additional technology is uh, roles in Final Cut, as I described. Roles uh, with IXML uh, allow you 
to basically manage, move, sort, arrange uh, groups of clips in Final Cut based on uh, types you designate to them, which are called roles. And so roles are incredibly useful in sound design. And when you go past these over, you could have a hundred sub roles within your edit. And those are each gonna be laid out on individual tracks when you send those to Logic, which you can do via XML. So you can send an XML and it's gonna send your role and sub role data to Logic, lay your tracks out for the sound designer exactly underneath your picture, according to the same uh, time base that you have. And it's going to lay this out in a very clean and organized way. Hey, and Sam, so- I'm sorry to interrupt, I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah. but we have a problem with your slides. Um, it seems as if you're changing it on your end, but the audience can't see it on their end. And all we see is session agenda. Um, I know some, some people probably has been taking notes, but we've only seen session agenda so far. Oh, cause I have, oh, wow, that's terrible. Okay. Um, can I try and reshare this? So what do they actually see? They only see- Only, I've been... only the agenda um, slide. Oh my so God. So, so here's what I've been showing you, everybody. Um, and then maybe I can give you the slides after the fact, but can you see the slides now? Yes. Um, if you want to hit play, just so we can see it on demand and see if you can switch over um, as you're uh, clicking. Let's so I guess it doesn't, you can't see them in full screen, I guess. Possibly. But I think everyone, if we agree, um, this is better than seeing just one slide, then I guess we can stay here. And as we switch forward, um, we'll, we'll move forward like that. Um, some people in the chat are asking if you can share later, please. Yes, uh, I'm truly sorry about that, everybody. So I will, uh, I will coordinate. Uh, maybe I can put the the slides in the chat now if anybody wants them, and so you can kind of take a look at what I was talking about because I was actually narrating a lot of the things that are present on the slides. So, uh, and I wasn't reading the chat, so I did not see this. So thank you for catching that. Um, let me actually go and see if I can. Uh, get to the chat here real quick and I'm going to see if I can just drag the slides directly in there. Okay, so my slides are currently uploading uh, in there. I truly apologize, everybody, but uh, I'm going to quickly walk through everything you should have seen. Um, so these are, and so I'm just confirming you can see these slides. And right. actually the Correct. And so now the keynote is in there. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry about that, everybody. Uh, these are, uh, okay, yes, hilarious. Yes, I, I apologize right, well, as well. I didn't catch it at first um, until we started going in and someone just mentioned it in the chat. Uh, okay, so close the format panel. Well, okay, so at the very least, um, let me just, I'm just going to go through them this way to uh, avoid that. Can you guys still see my slides at the moment? I'm now yes. I hit the green button as opposed to play. Let me just see if this if I hit play, whether that stops it. Oh, well, I can't move the. OK, can you see them now? OK, try and switch to the next one. Let's see if you it see works. it. Yes, yes, that works. So that works. OK, so now you can see them before you couldn't. All right, so let me just jump ahead to where I was then. Uh, sorry about that, everybody, but you do have the slides now in the chat. Um, so shot notes X, uh, so roles, we'll just go ahead and jump through to ProRes RAW. So why does ProRes RAW matter? Uh, ProRes RAW is a great editing codec that also really helps you preserve color fidelity and is, is all of the advantages of things like Red RAW and, and allows to be very flexible in color correction, but is also designed to also be an editing, uh, codec that gives you a much higher dynamic range and it is especially useful if you're interested in uh, mastering in HDR, which is going to progressively become more and more useful and needed. So uh, specifically, if you're looking to record ProRes RAW, uh, and this is highly compatible with Final Cut Pro, uh, you're going to want to look at the Atomos Ninja V or V+, Plus, which allows you to record ProRes RAW uh, and really turn any camera. Uh, specifically, I'll talk about the Z Cam in a minute. Uh, for seamless ProRes RAW creation that's going to be really useful as uh, a original media um, source that you're going to stay connected to the entire time. As opposed to making dailies, you want to work from ProRes RAW throughout your entire edit. Uh, now, one thing to note, it does not work natively and eventually resolve. So you're going to have to figure out a couple workarounds, but it's not that complicated. Uh, 
to get in there, but it's just something to be aware of. So this is something. Uh, so the last technology, of course, is Final Cut. You're at the Final Cut Creative Summit. Uh, but the bottom line is it's very easy to learn for beginners. So especially those who know iMovie. Uh, it has seamless project prep with shot notes and sync and link. Uh, there's a very easy IXMO workflow and uh, there's high-end color and HDR tools for grading. Uh, it works natively with ProRes RAW or Red RAW, and you can easily turn over the project to DaVinci Resolve or Logic. Uh, Pro Tools is a little bit harder, but you can get over to XML by AF, but th there's also a trick in turning over to Logic and then creating an AF for Pro Tools after you've done the conform yourself, and then that, sending that over by AF to uh, Pro Tools if you're working with someone who needs to use Pro Tools. So, uh, Based on all the things that I've talked about, now here are some core concepts that can save you a lot of the time, money, and aggravation that I was talking about earlier. Uh, first and foremost, uh, you never want to be separated from your original media, which means you want to natively edit in your RAW or master format, which should be in Final Cut, typically uh, ProRes RAW, uh, Red RAW, or uh, ProRes XQ, if you don't need to do HDR or any of that, you know, or you're just going to shoot with an ARRI camera that records natively to ProRes XQ, don't, don't shoot ARRI RAW. Uh, ideally, you're going to work and shoot with your end deliverable aspect ratio in mind. So for streaming workflows, that's typically either 4K 16 by 9 or a theatrical D, uh, DCP, that would be with a 185 to 1 aspect ratio, which is slightly it's like 2048 by 1080 in 2k versus 1920 by 1080 that's the the subtle adjustment typically i recommend for feature film that you can honestly get away with making a 185 to 1 dcp out of your 178 to 1 but if you want to do it the correct way oftentimes you may want to work in a 2k or 4k timeline which is either 4096 by uh 2048 or by uh 2060 uh or 2160 yeah 4096 by 2160 versus 3840 by 2160, which is the, the traditional uh, 4K spec for your HDTV. And then it's 2048 by uh, 1080 or 1920 by 1080. Uh, that's the 185 or, or 2K, 4K theatrical versus 16 by nine deliverables. I also recommend you do not make dailies ever. Don't do it. Uh, literally work with your original media and use sync and link to attach your native sound files so that you're always connected to your media, no matter what it is, uh, and, and build this from the very beginning. Do not make dailies. You can always apply your LUTs to your ProRes RAW files. So, and you can always work in proxy mode. If you do not have the fastest computer, you can always transcode to proxy in Final Cut and always stay connected to your original media, but this will save you endless amounts of time, money, and aggravation in your conform. Uh, additionally, uh, you can use metadata to speed project prep and for finding your clips later, which will reduce your laborious uh, assistant edit process and syncing, renaming, all of that stuff that typically happens. Uh, using time code to do your syncing as well is, is a huge time saver. Uh, you can also use search, keywords, favorites, rejections, smart collection, and batch renaming to always be able to find the footage you're looking for quickly as you go through an edit. These things are native to Final Cut um, and is one of the core advantages of why people might use Final Cut versus another NLE. Uh, like I said, edit in proxy note mode if you your, your uh, machine can't handle your original media and you'll just flip back and forth between proxy and original media in Final Cut. Um, and ideally, uh, you're going to work natively with ProRes RAW or Red RAW as the RAW formats. If you need to use Black Magic RAW or Airy, you're going to have to use probably Resolve to really work with those effectively. And uh, you know that that comes with its own pluses and minuses. But the RAW formats that are used in Final Cut are ProRes RAW and Red RAW. Uh, you can easily turn over a project to DaVinci Resolve or Logic from XML. We've kind of covered that. And uh, you can collaborate with VFX artists directly in your Final Cut timelines uh, with a shared cloud, cloud workflow, whether it be uh, Dropbox or uh, um, Google Docs or, or any of those things. Uh, basically, what can happen is you link to the, you, you, end, you render out the frames and you share those with a VFX collaborator. And I'll cover this in a little bit. And then uh, basically, 
they will update their renders through Dropbox and it'll link to that. And then magically their renders will update in your timeline if you're working with the original media. Uh, and additionally, I would also recommend that you leverage roles to easily create your various audio deliverables. Uh, especially when it comes to Netflix, it has many languages, et cetera. Final Cut has great captioning and, and there's a lot of different services where you can generate some of these things uh, at home uh, and save yourself quite a bit of money versus having someone else do it if you know how to leverage a lot of Final Cuts tools or some third-party caption tools uh, as well. So uh, this is where I talk to you about, okay, those are all concepts, but what should you actually do? What is the, the best you know, bang for your buck, dollar for dollar, the best way to approach uh, making a movie and having a cinema package that's going to really work for you? Uh, I recommend uh, obviously a high-end Mac. I don't recommend you get a Mac if you're looking to buy a Mac. Don't get one of the new MacBook Pros. I would not recommend uh, people buy one of the Macs at the moment. Uh, it, it's imminent that they're that are not M1 based, the M1 chip based. Apple's clearly moving over to an M1 chip. So if you need a used Mac or you need an iMac or something like that, you can get a used Mac from OWC. Uh, but what I recommend you do is either buy one of the new MacBook Pros to begin this process with, or if you don't need to buy right now, wait until uh, a new iMac or Mac Pro that's based on the M1 technology. That's going to be far better future proof for you. But this is going to run you, depending on what you buy, anywhere from 2,500 to 10 grand when it's all said and done. But uh, that's the machine that you probably should standardize on. Additionally, uh, if you're going to pick a camera for this process, the best bang for your buck, dollar for dollar at the moment, is getting a Z cam. Not a lot of people know what it is, but you can record uh, basically, uh, you know, and, and the camera body is similar to a red camera. Uh, 25 for between 2,500 to 6,000, you can record up to 8K ProRes RAW when combined with the Atomos uh, Ninja V or V Plus, really, probably the V Plus for the Z cam. Uh, and that's going to run you 1300 but you can be getting you know the, the z cams will allow you to to get anywhere between 4k and 8k native material when you combine that with the atomos through hdmi uh this is 15 stops of dynamic range that you know, just a beautiful image that you can get by a prores raw for a fraction of the cost uh, you can get nice lenses for anywhere between 1500 and 3500 dollars uh, Final Cut, Logic, and then there's an LG HDR monitor that you can get to grade HDR uh, for about $1,500 now. It's really not nearly as expensive as it used to be. And then when it comes to video storage, uh, I recommend that you look at the, the Thunder Bay 8 is probably the best bang for your buck for a ProRes RAW workflow. That's going to run you between two and $6,000. Uh, for portable or shuttle drives, I'd look at the OWC Envoy line. Uh, for high performance storage, if you know you need to be doing lots of multicam, uh, whether it's 4K or 8K, uh, you know, you might want to look at something like the Thunderblade, which is going to max out the Thunderbolt uh, three or four line speeds. Uh, and it's literally the fastest storage you can buy. It'll go about 2,800 megabytes a second and can even do multiple streams of uh, 4K DPX. And then uh, for archive storage, I recommend you look at the Mercury Pro or Mercury Pro Dual, there's up to 18 terabyte flavors. And these are basically just single or double spinning disk hard drives. Uh, and then if you're working in a shared storage environment, uh, for those of you who know me, I'll obviously recommend the Jellyfish. Uh, it's the best way to collaborate with video teams. You also can access your Jellyfish remotely, which means that you can turn it into your own private cloud uh, for remote collaborators and you don't have to pay excessive uh, cloud storage fees. So depending on what your budget is, uh, that can be very, very advantageous to you. Um, so uh, I've got a few minutes to go, but uh, what you're going to get out of this is it's going to deliver uh, native AK ProRes up to 15 stops of dynamic range, seamless sound turnover via XML. There's going to be no color conform uh, with this. You're going to stay with your original media the entire time and can even finish HDR with right within Final Cut. It's uh, Netflix ready for a 4K HDR master that you can tweak however you like. And uh, it's higher quality than most Hollywood movies, which believe it or not, are still 
finished in 2K. And in fact, uh, most VFX pipelines are not even in 4K yet. So uh, basically, uh, you don't need to use the Zcam though. And I'll, I'll basically walk through and, you know, I've left the slides in the chat. So I'll go through this relatively quickly. But uh, you can use uh, the Airy ProRes XQ uh, or Red Raw. You can shoot natively with Red Raw. Any Red camera will typically work fine for this purpose. Uh, you can also use uh, DSLR cameras or Canon if you want to use the Atomos Ninja trick and record ProRes Raw this way. It's far higher quality than the H.264 they typically create or, or one of the weird codecs from uh, Canon or Sony. Uh, and then iPhone, believe it or not, shoots native HDR, and this workflow will work for that, and you're going to work through. It also records ProRes, but a big gotcha with the latest uh, iPhones that now record ProRes is uh, it's still on the Lightning port. Until Apple updates to USB-C on the iPhone, uh, your transfer times on the iPhone are going to be painfully slow, so it's just something you need to be aware of. Uh, so uh, the post flow. The way that some of this would look when working according to this workflow is uh, you will be working always from your native uh, media in the app, which means you can grade and finish directly in Final Cut and it's and easily flip between your proxy or online workflow. It's a seamless online workflow. Uh, you can finish with the HDR tools in Final Cut, or you can go and export uh, something that you've started to grade in Final Cut and bring that into Resolve. Uh, you can uh, leverage an easy XML turnover to also Logic that is going to bring, as I discussed, all of the IXML data into Logic from Logic. If you understand how XML, you can match this to your movie, bring that in, test the conform, and then export an AAF and bring that. So do your own conform, and this will save you endless amounts of money when you start working with your sound designer. But you can also do a fest festival mix directly uh, just exporting some some tracks that you might work to do a basic mix with a less experienced sound designer or more affordable sound designer if you need to do something like a Sundance deliverable. Uh, I also covered uh, working with a VFX collaborator, but this can be a far easier way to work if you're working with your original materials. None of this works if you're in a dailies based workflow, though, and you're always going to have to go back to your original media. And this is what creates the expensive conform options that can cost you tens of thousands of dollars. So, uh, oh, and I think, uh, so, uh, yes, so I think I'm pretty much right at my time here, uh, and I want to make sure that we leave a little bit of time for questions, so with that in mind, I'm going to uh, stop my screen share, and maybe we can go ahead and dive into Q&A. Uh, so, does anybody have any questions? And I'll go right into the Q&A here. Um, Nathan asks, can we get the story printed on one of these target inspirational quote canvases for wall art? Uh, you know what? Why not? It's a long though. It's, it's extremely long. So I don't know if it'll fit. If you come up with a good format, absolutely. Um, is this information trans easily transferable to documentary filmmaking? Yes, some of it, but there's a couple other tools that I'd recommend you look at uh, from Intelligent Assistance. They've, a lot of their stuff has come a long way, but start looking at Lumberjack right from the very beginning and looking at that workflow. It's basically like shot notes, but for documentary uh, editors, there's endless things you can do. And then from there, there's all kinds of transcripts, services, et cetera. But start with Lumberjack and start looking at some of the tools from Intelligent Assistance. Um, and uh, Davis uh, asks, is, and I'm guessing this is probably Bill Davis, so Bill, uh, is this presentation based on your four-part article on FCP workflow based on, uh, it is loosely based on it. Uh, it is, yes, that is the, the, it is, that is the forerunner. So there is a four-part or five-part actually uh, red workflow series that went on fcp.co that I wrote a few years ago that goes into a lot of the things in more detail. It even covers Frame.io style workflows. I didn't want to get too into the weeds with everything here, but that is the basis for this. Uh, and I also wanted to include a little more production centric stuff in here. But uh, if someone can possibly post that into uh, Oh, hold on. So let me see. Oh, so Jeff Arbal asked, uh, did, did I say to edit in the highest 4K 4096 
uh, by 2160 versus 3840 by 2160. This is a judgment call. Um, so uh, do I, what do I recommend? What would I typically recommend? If you think that you might be screening theatrically, you might as well start your native resolution at 4096 by 2160, which is 4K DCI workflow, and then uh, conform to a 3840 by 2160, 16 by nine uh, delivery to a typical 4K TV. And you can do that in a couple of different ways. Uh, you can literally just duplicate the sequence and change the sequence settings and Final Cut will then adjust some of your clips or possibly adjust your reel or you can you can change or use a compound clip to do some of this in final cut that is one way but i would typically recommend if you're going to go you'd make your dcp from the 49 uh 4096 by 2160 and go down to 3840 by 2160 uh by duplicating that sequence start highest and work your way downward would typically be what i would recommend but when you think about your image pipeline you want to make sure that your DP understands what your target resolution is first, and they should start with the frame guides and start by framing those for your ideal delivery format so that you know that you don't have to do a lot of reframing or pan and scan. I can't tell you how many anamorphic movies have sold and then have had to go through a horrendous looking pan and scan process or have been told that they can't be distributed at all because they cho were, chose to shoot anamorphic. Also, anamorphic can lead to a whole... Uh, chain reaction of uh, de-squeezing dailies and things that are very painful if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, where can you find an audio post house or team that works with logic and familiar with Final Cut workflows? So what I recommend that you do is, uh, first off, if you want to get really creative, one thing that I actually hope in the future happens is that people start working with musicians, maybe over dedicated uh, sound designers in some cases and start looking at their movies almost more as soundtracks. This is a whole pet creative thing that I'd like to see happen in the future. Uh, musicians know logic seamlessly. Most musicians know it like the back of their hand. Your composer probably knows very well how to, and it probably can help you prep a lot of the things that you might be doing in uh, logic. So all that said, my recommended workflow is bring an XML into Logic. Uh, I actually did a whole log or Final Cut to Logic series uh, for FCP Works a few years back. Uh, if someone can find those links or just reach out to me, Sam at WeMakeMovies.org if you want to see what those are. But the bottom line is import an XML with all of your sub roles correctly laid out. Check your conform in Logic. Once you've got it right the way that you want it, then make an AAF from logic that you know is correct, that's going to seamlessly open up in Pro Tools. That's the way that I recommend that you do that. Uh, all right, so uh, let's see here. Uh, what's my opinion about Blackmagic cameras? Which one specifically and what lens maybe to go with it? Um, so my official opinion on Blackmagic cameras is that Blackmagic RAW doesn't work in Final Cut, so it kind of disqualifies for me. I also don't love the way they reproduce color, quite honestly. So for my particular workflows, I'm always going to lean to either RED or ZCam or Canon or Sony because I like the way that they produce color better. If you're in a Resolve workflow, though, Blackmagic RAW is fantastic and it's going to work and flow through. So if you're very comfortable beginning and, and starting a, a feature film directly in Resolve, that's certainly a viable path. Uh, so with that said, uh, between the different cameras, you know, for me, I haven't seen a huge difference in the higher end Resolve cameras in terms of look, feel. Typically, it always feels like a Blackmagic camera shot it. Um, and then lenses, I'm not even going to get into that. I'm probably not the person to make a solid lens recommendation. Uh, a lot of that, you know, <laughs> We'll let a DP, they'll have endless things to sort of say about that. Or if someone really wants to give, you know, the state of the art of where high-end lens technology is, please someone kind of put that in there. Um, the dollar amount that I would consider a project max out to be considered micro budget. Uh, here's how I view micro budget or, or the way that micro budget, I, I don't think there's a good budget. I think micro budget movies should be done by director, editor types who are gonna do the majority of the post work themselves, keep it in house and ideally figure out how they're gonna deliver it by ideally working on their own gear and are 
not going to work with a lot of expensive collaborators. That's how I would denote a micro budget movie, at which point you might need to raise a little bit of money to go work with someone who's a little bit higher end. But, you know, this is for the DIY crowd who wants to deliver something um, high end uh, that looks high end, that uses the same technology Hollywood uses, but does not use anywhere near the same budget. So I know that's a bit of a cop out. Our micro budget movies that we're doing at We Make Movies are all going to be twenty five thousand uh, dollars in terms of budget. Um, and uh, hey, what's up, Philip? Good to see you, too, man. Uh, is there a manual for shot notes? Uh, yes. So you can use the batch renaming feature in Final Cut. Uh, I actually made a video way, way, way back when on using batch renaming in Final Cut, um, where you can globally use the info tab of Final Cut like a spreadsheet and add metadata to your clips in there, and then use the batch renaming and save effect preset buttons in Final Cut to uh, batch rename your clips by selecting multiple ones, creating a custom name preset, which is typically seen, uh, take angle in some capacity for, but using the metadata columns in Final Cut to rename your clips using the batch renaming feature is a very pain-free way to do this if you didn't use shot notes. Uh, let's see, uh, being this about low budget filmmaking as an investor in movies, is there a checklist that can be used to gauge the skill level of the person pitching the movie? Um, so the reality is, uh, a conversation is usually the best way to do it. Uh, and, uh, you know, a simple way is like, all right, have you made a feature before and have you sold it and what was the distribution experience like if they don't have a horror story they probably don't know what they're doing that's the simplest question to ask uh, if they don't have a terrible thing to say about the industry they probably haven't done very much so within that uh, on, a, on a practical level um you know if you know post-production and you're going to feel out uh and actually i know i'm right up at time do i have to stop now or is this uh where do we go from here I think we're right at three, but um, uh, yes, we are exactly at three o'clock, but I will, um, you know, stay on for a couple more minutes just to finish up these last set of questions. Once we finish that up, we will have to depart. Those of you that are departing now, just a reminder to fill out the survey that pops up right after this session. Um, that'll be a great help uh, to everyone and especially Sam after this session. Um, but I'll let you finish up these last bit of questions and then we'll depart. Okay. So basically to, to quickly finish this up, uh, let me just go through some quick ones here. Any suggestions how to use Panasonic DSLR with the quality of the Canon? Uh, yes, use uh, the Atomos uh, Ninja V or V plus for that. So that you would use that for the Panasonic DSLRs. Uh, Nikon would be the same. I believe uh, if you go to the Amaz uh, Atomos page, it's going to have a list of compatible cameras, but Nikon I think is covered as well. So you should be able to do ProRes RAW from the Nikon. Uh, and does micro budget films help your film career? Is it better to do micro budget feature or short films? Um, here's the way that I look at this. It, you're probably not going to make a ton of money with your micro budget films, but it, what it will allow you to do is handle anything life uh, throws at you by making your own micro budget film. If you learn how to do the work and implement the workflow that I'm kind of mentioning here yourself, uh, you will be able to solve so many problems for particularly corporate and, and other places, you will become invaluable and indispensable as a content creator because you know how to solve your own problems, which is better than pretty much anyone in Hollywood can say. So that is really the where it's going to really help you in your career is becoming self-reliant for yourself and for your clients on your own projects. And I think I covered most of the things here. So uh, I think that's it. Uh, so the slides, uh, oh, and Aubrey, thank you, Aubrey. Uh, my beautiful wife, Aubrey has uh, agreed to post any of the slides if anyone needs them or you couldn't download them at wemakemovies.org slash micro budget. And I think with that, I'm over time. Thank you everybody for tuning out. Hopefully you got something out of that. Sorry you couldn't see the slides as I was going, but anyone has any questions, hit me up at uh, sam at wemakemovies.org. That's sam at wemakemovies.org. Thanks everybody.